Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the MedTech Impact Podcast, where you get to hear from leaders and innovators who are shaping the future of medical technology. I'm Kyle Cruz. And I'm Richard Mikuljong. And we're your hosts of the show. So today on the MedTech Impact Podcast, we're delighted to be joined by Uros Kuzmanovic, CEO and co-founder of Biosensei. Uros, welcome to the show. Hey guys, really, really nice to be here. Thanks a lot. Uh, we are pumped to have you on. Uh, super excited to tell, to sorry, to share the story of Biosensei. Um, uh, as we kick things off, we always like to frame it for the audience. So please tell us what is the big problem that Biosensei is looking to solve. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I am looking to help the almost eight million women which have difficulty getting pregnant or carrying a pregnancy, and we're starting by uh, doing that by making a a novel uh, progesterone estrogen sensor, something that women can use at home. Um, and also reworking the IVF experience, really trying to improve that for both users and gynecologists. Amazing. And so in terms of that problem, is there you know a specific case that you're trying to solve within this fertility issue or challenge that you're facing? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's multifaceted. So uh, there's a number of issues uh, where... Uh, women at home lack uh, an easy, affordable uh, way to get a test on their hormones. Um, we've seen this issue in, in rural communities as well, where uh, women lack resources to go to like a clinic or, or hospital and do a traditional blood draw. Um, also existing solutions today, uh, they're not so accurate. And so we're really trying to bring that gold standard uh, to the women at, at home, trying to get a sense about their uh, you know, fertility health, or hormonal health. Um, and then on the other side for, for IVF clinics, it's, it's just been um, a really uh, difficult hormone testing protocol where uh, women have to come in uh, before work at 6 a.m. in the morning and kind of uh, compete with one another in this small space to, to do a blood draw and then uh, go through the rest of their day uh, after that experience. Um, and so for, for clinics, it's been a challenge to, um, you know, operationally have the nurses and phlebotomists and technicians and be able to pay for really expensive lab instruments uh, to do this work. So trying to trying to uh, help both sides. You know, it's such a, yeah. Go ahead, Richard, please. Well, I was just going to say, it's such a huge thing around, you know, yeah. this, this problem. And you've got, you know, the, the, the millions of women that you're trying to support and you know, the families that you're trying to build and, and, and help create. Um, and one of the stats, I think, was, you know, 40% of women have ovulatory dysfunctions. And, you know, that's something you're clearly trying to hone in on. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's um, it, it's turned out to be a, a really, really big issue where <clears throat> this is this is somewhat recent, um, you know, uh, uh, data and, and information. I think this space has been so heavily under-researched and underfunded. Um, so I think Recently, we're getting more information about what exactly is, uh, what exactly are the causes of infertility, um, and it's a two-sided coin. You know, uh, it's, it's issues on on the side of females, but also males. But uh, we felt like we could really bring a lot of impact on um, the female uh, fertility assessment side, just because it's been so underserved for so long. Uh, but you're right. So so the main cause is really ovulatory dysfunctions. And that's what we're starting out with to help. Euros, this is obviously just such a um, huge, huge problem. I mean, there's no doubt. And I think, you know, you don't really you don't realize it right until you get older and all your friends and family around you, they're trying to, you know, have children and you realize just like how difficult and challenging it truly is and how many people actually suffer from this. And you see, you know, like the just the real just psychological and mental pain and suffering. And it's it's really sad. And, and you know, it makes people like me and my wife, we feel so incredibly grateful to have brought, you know, two beautiful children into this world. And it's like, goodness, you know, my, my heart goes out. So I'm eager to hear really about your solution and how you're solving this problem. 
Yeah. Um, first of all, on, on that point, it it is exactly right. Unfortunately, a lot of people that we know either had trouble themselves or they know a friend or family member that that has had trouble um, or have gone through IVF, right? And, and IVF itself is just such a difficult experience. Um, one in three chance, right? If, if I believe uh, 35 or, or under, uh, so multiple people go through, you know, multiple cycles and uh, the cost of it as well. It's it's not super affordable. So it's it's just a really difficult experience also for for the couple going through it, you know, um, that pain and anxiety. Uh, it's physically painful. It's emotionally exhausting. You you just never know with each cycle. And and uh, so, you know, it we're just trying to yeah make make some change there, make it a bit easier for the folks in that in that space because it's so difficult. But um, what are we trying to do? Well, we are trying to uh, offer them and put into their hands a portable uh, test where they could, you know, instead of having to go to a hospital or clinic, right, uh, you know, waking up at 5 a.m. or scheduling every day, every other day, um, they could, from the comfort of their homes, do a, a hormone test uh, and get instant results. And then uh, basically communicate that uh, to their gynecologist or physician. And so we're really trying to, for example, on the IVF side, uh, minimize the number of visits per cycle, right, that you have to go in person. And um, so on average right now, it's anywhere from three to six times, right, per cycle. Um, and we're trying to bring it down to maybe once that you would have to go down uh, to to an IVF clinic. Um and so that creates, you know, value for, for both sides in a number of ways, um, especially for the for the patient where they could lead their normal life in a way uh, without having to alter it significantly to go through this process. Um, a lot of people drop out of IVF cycles just because it's so demanding, right? They have to uh, give up their career. Uh, they have to, um, you know, make make so much time uh, aside from their normal, normal, normal life to be able to do it. So um, we're excited about this product that we're trying to put in, in people's hands. And uh, we're starting in this space, but we, we think there could be a lot more applications with it, actually. So we've had uh, during our customer discovery, women reach out to us and say, well, I'm, I'm really frustrated with my uh, hormonal birth control. You know, can I can I possibly use this to identify when I'm like most fertile, so I I don't, you know, uh, conceive during that time, um, or how about like menopause, right? Um, can I use this to diagnose or identify if I have you know menopausal or perimenopausal, you know, symptoms, right? So should I should I be talking to my physician about hormone replacement therapy, right? Mm -hmm. um, postpartum depression, we've we've had people reach out and say. Well, you know, I just had this pregnancy and it's it's been really tough afterward. And uh, there's so many hormonal changes that a woman goes through after after giving birth. Right. Um, they want they want to be more empowered. They want more insight. They want to know what's going on with their bodies. Um, and so we're just trying to help um, kind of give more information. Can you give us um Kind of, can you describe, I guess, what your product and technology looks like and maybe a little bit more about how it works? Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, I guess I should have should have brought the prototype with me. So it's a it's a handheld uh, measurement device and it has uh, disposable test strips. Uh, so that's the two two components. And then uh, there's a smartphone application. And so smartphone application will just track test results and then you know, you can send that, communicate with a physician gynecologist um, with that data. So it's basically like three parts. Um, the closest analog I, I could give really for workflow is uh, what diabetics use, like the glucometer. Mm -hmm. And so it would be a finger prick um, uh, and, and you would do a, a small blood draw there, uh, finger prick, and then you would add that bit of blood to the test strip and, and get a reading. Mm -hmm. um, we thought it would be a, a hurdle when we first, you know, uh, rolled it out or are pushing this direction um, for women in the space. But they're they're so incredibly motivated and they 
are so incredibly motivated to have a child that they have told us this is the easiest thing I've done all day. You know, going through IVF cycles, going through blood draws, going through uh, doping themselves with injections. Um, so really that it hasn't been so much of a hurdle. I want to give a, a preview to our, uh, I would say an exciting piece of work for us that's that's going on right now. Uh, we're making a continuous wearable actually. Um, so kind of a, again, analogous to a continuous glucose monitor uh, where customers can wear that for a number of days at a time. Uh, and you can get continuous readings on your hormone levels. And so that would be uh, minimally invasive and uh, really easy to use. So, you know, slap it on, like just get the readings uh, and then you can you can decide if you want to share that with your physician, gynecologist, or you want to retain that information. So that's what oh, we're fant pushing. Fantastic. And I guess what are you seeing, um, you know, with with testing in, in your product uh, today? Yeah. Um, so we, we made a lot of great progress testing with, uh, commercial, uh, blood samples. And so we're gearing up for, uh, pilot studies and, and we've gotten a lot of pilot study partners that are excited to work with us, um, again, to kind of rework their existing hormone testing protocol. Uh, so, uh, I'm not sure if I can name, name names at this point, but, uh, they're, they're in the new England area. Uh, a lot of fertility clinics looking to rework their IVF uh, hormone testing protocols. So, yeah, it sounds like you know you're starting to really hit on what that that market looks like. And you know, uh, Richard, we always talk about the go to market strategy, which is I think um, kind of a good topic of discussion here next. You know, yeah. And so you mentioned those favorite two words of mine: customer discovery. You've obviously been getting a lot of great feedback. You're starting to build the partners. You're really getting, you know, that product development in terms of, you know, that next opportunity. You mentioned about the wearable device. Um, and something I think that always stands out with you, Yoros, is you've been amazing at leveraging every opportunity in the ecosystem. I know for us here um, and, you know, Kyle as well, you know, we've known you for a number of years and just seen how you've tapped in and, and made the most of opportunities. You were a winner of the 200K Challenge in 2022. So could you talk a little bit about how that's helped you in your journey and leveraging these opportunities? Yeah. Uh, I always had this kind of scrappy approach, um, kind of a, a bootstrapping approach to it. And maybe it's coming from academia. I'm not sure, but I, yeah, I, I always wanted to leverage everything I could. And my philosophy was always more shots on goal. Uh, you'll, you'll have a higher chance of scoring. So um, I would apply I would apply to <laughs> you got got a Here's the hockey fun. stick. Okay, there we Can't go. Take that shot. Let me run. Those shots on goal, Euros. I love it, there man. Great analogy. <laughs> um, so I, you know, when I was fundraising the very, very early stages, I would apply to every every pitch competition I could. And uh I just had to get out there and you get better every time, right? That's that's another positive that comes from it. You're better at pitching, your network grows, you get, you know, more feedback, you might grow your team, maybe somebody's interested. Um, you learn about regulatory or whatever it is, you, you just keep getting better. Um, and I was just super fortunate to, you know, uh, participate in the M2D2 program and, uh, you know, be able to, to be supported by you guys as well. Um, and so you, you guys have been a fantastic resource, just as I mentioned, I think earlier, just constantly checking in asking if I ever needed anything um, in terms of hiring, in terms of potential partners, in terms of product development, uh, just the sponsors you you brought in, right? The in-kind awards. Um, I got a chance to work with NPR, right? On what what that timeline would look like, right? For a, a alpha and beta prototype. Um, I got to, through the impact program and, and uh, the 200K challenge, work with the Hologic folks. So large publicly traded women's health company, right? I got to meet their top execs. And through that uh, relationship, I got a fantastic letter of support uh, from one of the, the top uh, directors of innovation there. Um, and that I used for my NSF SBIR phase two, which I think made it made a huge impact. So um, it's all tied together. I, I think you just, as a startup, uh, you know, co-founder, you, you have to be super scrappy. Um, 
yeah, so that's always been my my philosophy. So I, I thank you guys for providing that, you know, platform. Well, I do want to just chime in real quick because when you look at your events page on your website, you are <laughs> literally somewhere like it feels like every other week, you know, or at least every month you're doing something big, um, which I think is a huge takeaway for the audience, obviously. And anyone that's looking to bring a medical technology or start any kind of business, right? That scrappy mindset. I think it's fantastic. Um, sorry to interrupt Richard, but it's just- no, honestly, Cal, that's the one point. I mean, and again, I think the big takeaway from this for the audience is we are all in this game of communication. You know, you were talking about there about how you get better every time you stand up and you present. And yep. it's so important, whatever stage your company is at, that you practice that messaging, you go out and you share that messaging, you hone that message. And so you've been an absolute master at doing that. So kudos to you. Um, you know, it's super exciting seeing all the progress and, and all the recent wins you've had. And, and again, taking this technology from an academic setting, now transitioning that and translating it into the commercial environment. You know, Kyle, it makes me think about what's ahead for the sort of things that come up naturally in this progress around things like regulatory and reimbursement. That's right. You know, and I mean, I'm sure you're, you're working with a lot of, um, you know, professionals and experts in the med tech community. And I'm sure you're talking with doctors and all and, and using your products with, with patients, you know, so tell us more about that regulatory pathway and, and kind of where you are today. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, again, through the M2D2, <laughs> Uh, program, I, I got a chance to uh, talk to the Arcumis folks. Um, and, you know, we put together a, a proposal about what that would look like, right? The regulatory pathway. Um, also, just looking at previous uh, winners and, and people that have pitched the M2D2 competition, I, I learned through that as well, just how they approached the regulatory side. Um, uh, but yeah, talking to Arcumis, we we put together a proposal, which which was great. So I think that laid kind of the the path for us, of how to move forward. Um, and I also got a chance to talk to Hologic's internal regulatory board. Uh, they were large enough to have their own, uh, you know, uh, regulatory uh, folks, and so that was really helpful. And then through you know pitching and and uh, meeting other other folks through accelerators, other programs. I uh, got to talk to some other regulatory consultants. So point of the story is um, you want to get out there and, and talk to experts and consultants and um, people who know more about the space than you do. Um, and that was really helpful for me to kind of see what's ahead of us. Um, so particularly for us, that first product, it would be like a class one 510K um, application, which which isn't too bad. Uh, so I don't scare away too many investors. Um, but uh, it, it was really helpful to do that because now I can design uh, those pilot studies with partners in a particular way uh, to be able to approach the FDA. And mm -hmm. so uh, what you don't want to do is go through the FDA twice or come back to them, if, you know, after uh, some negative marks. So you, you want to come prepared. And uh, I think that's where, again, talking to the right folks is is critical so you can set up the next steps for your company to be successful. So, or, and, and I yeah. guess what have the, you know, you're, you're, you must be working obviously with, with phys physicians and patients, I guess, you know, what has the feedback been like from them? Yeah. Um, so I mean, other than the finger pricking that they have no problem doing because <laughs> obviously it's like, they'll do whatever. And I mean, like I seriously think that women are like so much like stronger and braver. Oh, yeah. like, like it's amazing. Like right, the power of of women and like just yeah, oh, uh, you know how I, it I inspires think, them. Like yeah. it's just. But anyways, yeah. Tell us more about that feedback. I guess especially from a physician standpoint. Yeah. Um. So, I completely agree with you. I think. <laughs> It's it's silly to say, but I think women are are like a better species. They're like a, a better, stronger, you know, version. Um, so kudos to them. Seriously, I, I think uh, I'm really always amazed by the women I talk to, and what they go through. Um, but from a physician side, so I've gotten a chance to talk to a number of physicians that uh, perform you know IVF uh, cycles, and they they just talk about how much it would mean. For, for their customers and patients, right? Um, how much it would alleviate their difficulties, right? As as we're mentioning, right? The previous 
uh, point, um, seeing them happier, seeing them, uh, their time being given back or, or seeing them um, have an easier experience, I, I think means a lot to them. Um, oftentimes when I talk to clinic owners, the customer experience uh, is the top priority. Like, so, so making sure that, you know, of course they're successful, they, they have a successful IVF cycle, but uh, it, it's just such a, a daunting and physically demanding one that they are so honed into that customer experience that they were excited for what we're doing because of, of that reason. What does success look like too when comparing it to the traditional methods? Yeah. Um for for like an IVF cycle or Yeah, com- you know, and and how does your technology help improve the success rate, you know, if you could be yeah. maybe a little bit more specific there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um so basically what we found was timing is a huge uh a factor for IVF cycles. So um being able to possibly test more frequently or test at the right time points uh, directly will affect what what drug or what dose or when a patient should come in. So um, again, allowing allowing uh, users to do this throughout the whole day and you you know do it at home um, would basically increase the chance of a successful IVF uh, cycle just because you have more control on the timing. So the physician has uh, more information to be able to dictate the next steps. Like, okay, now we should do a trigger shot, or now we should, um, you know, remove uh, or take take the egg, or uh, now you should be doping yourself with with this drug. Um, so I think it's it's a good. It increases the chances by allowing for uh, more information, so they can take better action. Amazing. And I love that focus around the experience. Of course, you know, that's why we're all here. We're trying to help patients. But as we touched on before, this is such a potentially emotional burden when you're yeah. trying to have children. And so the fact that you can provide any improvement to that process is so important and try to remove those burdens and those challenges. And of course, you will be having your own challenges as you develop this technology. And so I wondered if you can now talk a little bit about something um which I think is kind of, again, really interesting for listeners who are trying to take academic research into the commercial setting. And of course, that's something with your work at BU, you're doing yourself. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that's been as a process. Yeah, for sure. Um, that that was a journey. I, I think, you know, to be honest, in the, at the start, um, we were looking at animal health care, right? Like animal, uh, animal health, animal reproduction. So it was and then we made the pivot. We realized, you know, it wasn't as uh, as much of a need there, or as much of a problem. And then we we shifted. We also had a number of sensors. So which sensor should we kind of go to market with first? Um, even even today, I was first thinking about going direct to consumer as a go to market strategy. Right? You guys you guys talked about that earlier. Um, but now I'm thinking, you know, B two B to fertility clinics would maybe be an easier uh, entry for us. Um, so it's, it's always shifting, I think, and you, you're constantly honing, um, and, and getting a better approach, getting a better sense of what the market really wants and and what are the hurdles, uh, just as as an example for the D2C space, you know, we, we had to think about customer acquisition, right? Growing our customer base, advertising, marketing, uh, also education, right? So sometimes, um, some women that we talked to didn't fully understand uh, all of the um, uh, roles that their sex hormones had um, and how that related to fertility. So, you know, when you're having that kind of um, uh, starting point, then it makes it more difficult to sell to sell a product where, you know, you're assessing hormones. Right. So um, and then we looked at the B2B space and fertility clinics and, and they had a really clear uh, use case and application and need. And so that that's making a lot of sense for us right now. Um, I would say the most critical thing is really customer discovery um, for any any startup, right? And especially ones coming from academia. And I think what what happens oftentimes in academia, especially if it's like a PhD work, it's kind of a more advanced technology. Um, sometimes the technology is 
more mature than than understanding of the problem or need in the market. And it's not the ideal way you should go about building a company, right? You you say, you know, identify the nail and then build the hammer, you know, mm. a, around it. But sometimes some technologies are so transformational or they're so novel or they're so advanced that it's not entirely clear at the start like what that problem is that, that it's going to address or solve. And that's why I think academics looking to spin out should really double down on the customer discovery. So really, really make sure that there truly is a problem, uh, there truly is a market and a, and a need for what you're doing. Um, because that's that's really everything. It, it doesn't matter how cool the tech is, you know, if people aren't going to use it. Like I, I kind of think about if I made a teleportation machine, you if it, if I had like a, if there really wasn't a problem, people won't buy it, right? You know, it'll just kind of mm -hmm. die, die by the bench side, right? So, it's so true. And and Richard, if I may just chime in one more time here, um, you know, it, Euros, I just I'm fascinated here as, as some of the things that you said, and I think that that B two B kind of market strategy, go to market strategy, makes a ton of sense. And and I wonder if I'm on to, or if I'm I'm hearing you correctly, but. But uh, I would imagine too the the patient here, um, like that alignment too um, between the patient and the doctor and the, the 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 lines of communication, right? From a timing standpoint, from just understanding what they need to do next, mm -hmm. it's got to be so much like better and and just a more integrated kind of approach i feel like um than than that b2c approach so it, it just makes so much sense yeah yeah for sure um and and just to be clear like my my dream is to have uh if you guys are wearing an apple watch or aura like have the next step of that so have users wear a patch where they can monitor not just hormones but uh organ health markers or neurotransmitter, just have a holistic insight into their health state. That's really the the vision I'm building towards. But again, it's how to get there. And I, I think um, when we looked at this space, D to C, then we looked at B to B as, as a as a go to market. We think that's a, a better step for us. It's like a the 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 height isn't as tall, right? You know, we we could we could make impact, we could move forward, we can build towards our vision, uh, but it wouldn't be such a large jump. And so uh, it's kind of a stepwise approach. Yeah, it makes so much sense, Kyle. And, uh, and I think to your point, that B2B model is just, you know, got so much opportunity to get alignment between the patient and physician. And so it makes a lot of sense. Uh, the other item I wanted to quickly touch on in terms of challenges just around IP. And, and again, coming from an academic setting and taking that out, I just wondered how you found navigating that. So I know again that can sometimes be problematic. Yeah, yeah. I was very fortunate to um, be working with uh, Professor James Galligan at, at Boston University, and he, at from the very start, uh, knew we we should be patenting before we publish. And so, uh, unfortunately, it's it's not uh, always the case that every professor knows this, um, or it's not the case that professors want to spin out a company. And so a lot of professors have uh, only publications in mind and, and on the forefront of, of their, you know, goals. Um, but fortunately, you know, Professor Galligan uh, made sure that we were patenting any any exciting work that could potentially be, you know, used uh, in the real world, right? Um, and so I was also lucky to be given um, uh, the flexibility and kind of responsibility to push forward these patents. So... I actually got, uh, I, I was working with the patent uh, firms very closely to to file uh, the patent application. So that, that gave me a great insight into the process and then also be able to um, help them file because oftentimes people think, okay, law firms will just, you know, uh, file the technology for you and they'll just make it happen. Uh, but it, it's actually not the case. You You have to really provide a lot of insight uh, from your end, the technical end, and then also be able to translate that. Um, how does this technology actually address something in the real world, or how does it differ from existing technology uh, to be able to to uh, get those patents filed? Um, so fortunately, we had, I think, maybe five or six filings. Four have been granted. granted. 
uh, the claims to them have been grant granted. So, and then recently we we executed an option agreement uh, with Boston University. And so I think that's also a critical um, uh, moment for a startup where you have exclusive licensing rights to to that IP that, uh, you know, the university helped you, um, you know, secure. And a lot of people have uh, kind of a, a negative, um, you know, association with their academic institution filing for, for IP for them. But I think we had over 300,000 in uh, patent filing costs. And so, uh, you know, that's not something that every startup can uh, foot the bill for, right? And so I would much rather have uh, our technology protected rather than waiting uh, for the competition to possibly scoop it or uh, protect it or, uh, and then going to investors saying, you know, we don't have any IP protected or we don't have anything filed. I think that's that's kind of a, a deal breaker. Yeah, I mean, you answered honestly my next question around funding, getting IP because it's expensive. Uh, it's and expensive. so, to your point, if you know if the academic setting can provide that for you, and then you get that all important foundation that's going to allow you to build and go to investors, it's so important. Uh, exactly. And so, Kyle, you know, I think that what Euros has shown here is he's got an amazing foundation, an amazing platform, amazing technology to take forward. So, yeah, it's really yeah. exciting. Oh, I would agree. And I mean, obviously, there not have only been just incredible milestones already that have been achieved. And obviously, again, congratulations, Euros, on the recent uh, grant um, that you guys received for a million dollars. I mean, just incredible. It's going to be a huge help. Um, now, looking forward in these next kind of 6, 12, 18 months, you know, what's the plan? What other future milestones do you have in store? And where are you guys going? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, super excited about that. Um, we're growing right now. So uh, we are hiring, uh, looking to put together really and grow that nucleus that we have of, of the folks that make it happen. Um, and so with those folks that we're putting together, uh, really looking to to pilot study, uh, to do a pilot study with our uh, with a progesterone and estrogen sensor, actually, uh, with some of these clinics. And so uh, excited to do that and and really put our product to the test um you know accuracy like how how well does it compare to the gold standard uh how well does it compare to what clinics are using right now so um that's that's a huge milestone for us and then uh the second one we actually have a cortisol uh, sensor and uh so I'm doing I'm doing a lot of market you know research there as well as we as we mentioned earlier in the the podcast but uh one application that we're excited about is um, like out licensing actually to uh, uh, companies that are in the diabetes space. And so kind of pairing with blood sugar monitoring, uh, actually monitoring of cortisol levels. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's um, really neat, though, is, you know, here you are, you're talking about, you know, really exciting partnership opportunities. You're exploring new capabilities, you know, for your product. Um, you know, you're hiring out, uh, you know, building your team, um, you know, which is really probably one of the most important pieces here, right? Is your team is everything. Yep. Richard, we talk about it all the time. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I'm really curious to know you, Ross, like how you're thinking about building a team in terms of, of course, skill set, but like you obviously have this massive mission, which I'm sure people can easily buy into. So what's the sort of your approach to building that team and identifying the right talent? Yeah, um, I I also recently have to give a shout out to uh, Fifty Years VC. Uh, they they had a program I, I I'm wrapping up with now Fifty Fifty, and they talked about hiring being uh, kind of actually the most important thing you can do as a CEO, um, which makes it a bit daunting, <laughs> but. Uh, it's it's a tough task. It's a really really difficult, I, I think, task for for CEOs or first time founders or young startups, because I feel like this is the most critical point, right? So the people that I bring in now are again going to form that nucleus and the identity or the brand of Biosensate in a way, um. And so it does give me anxiety of, of, you know, who am I exactly bringing on and, and uh, some of the values that they stand for. Um, 
and what we're going to build together as a company, right? I, I think to your point, uh, it makes it a bit easier for me to compete like against large companies like, uh, I don't know, what, you you name it, like a Google or whatever. Uh, when I could when I could sell them the vision, when I could talk about the vision, you know, what we're doing and where we're where we're headed, um, I think that's a unique advantage of startups, right? That you could uh, uh, tell them you're going to work on something life changing. You're going to save millions of lives or in our case, you you might help start millions of lives. Like, I think that's incredibly impactful. Um, and some people uh, allow that to be their life mission, right? And so we have a unique advantage there. Um, and I'm trying to kind of leverage and lean into that. But again, uh, this is kind of uh, building from the ground up. So the people that you bring in will dictate uh, a lot of what the company is moving forward. So it's a tough task. Yeah, but I, and also we should mention that, you know, what we started off by saying you are a co-founder and I think that's something investors want to look at and see that, you know, there's a solid team that de-risks it by having more than one person committed to this process. So maybe you could talk a little bit about your co-founder as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so very, very lucky again to have, uh, you know, my my former professor, James Galligan, uh, very involved. Um, so actually I just got off a, a call with him before this, we were talking about hiring, right? So we were, <laughs> we were uh, evaluating, um, you know, potential hires and, and what we're looking for. And we were strategizing on the technical side, how to, uh, what kind of roles, what kind of skill sets we needed. Um, it wasn't just James, it was, it was uh, another co-founder, Doug Densmore. Um, so we had a fantastic discussion there and uh, super lucky to have their input and have their time and devotion. Um, you know, both of them are not folks that will come on, you know, like once every six months to, just to check in how things are doing. Uh, but they're very active. Um, and, you know, uh, James brings a lot of fantastic technical support and input and, and strategy. Uh, Doug, Doug has done it before uh, with a number of startups. And so he, he's on the board of Asimov. Uh, if you guys have, have heard of that company. So I think they just did a series C for 200 million. Um, he, he knew Alec, the, the founder, co-founder and CEO uh, when he was still a student. Um, and so he's actually done it a number of times where he spun out companies from academia into the real world. Um, so super lucky to have his support. Fantastic. And, and I think the point you're making as well around having active founders, you know, you don't want people on the cap table who are sitting there who are just not contributing. And that's so important as you grow your company to make sure that everybody's adding value. So that's yep. really, you know, fantastic to hear that you have that in place. And Kyle, I feel like, you know, Euros has been providing advice all the way through this, you know, between customer discovery, between, you know, how to spin out from academia, you know, there's just been so many great things to take away. So yeah, yeah, I'm sure as we look ahead, there's like probably a big vision in there. Yeah. And we always like to do a little reflection, you know, and, and it's always important and valuable um, to learn kind of what are, you know, your top, you know, one, two, three tips that you might have for, you know, other folks in, in that's looking to, you know, do what you do, maybe invent, um, bring a medical technology to market. Um, you know, what would those? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think about that, this question actually quite a bit. Um, I haven't crystallized my answers completely, but I'll, I'll kind of give some off the top of my head. I, I think about timing and, and cadence actually quite a bit, like the cadence to things. Um, so before uh, you you might have uh, the impression that everything you can make everything happen in the moment or the next day uh, people will get back to you um, in a few hours or uh, this investor will you know give you input on on, on something that you sent them uh, immediately. Uh, there is a certain cadence to things and you can't rush certain things. So you have to kind of be aware of a, a timing. Um, sometimes investors need two, three weeks, four weeks to get back to you, right? Um, sometimes a partnership just needs to kind of uh, ferment in a way, right? You know, you, you don't want to push that partner too too hard, right? Um, 
sometimes a, a, a person like a hire or maybe a, a, a colleague that you're working with will grow into a role, right? But they need maybe some time. So I think about cadence quite a bit. Um, I think timing is a big one, especially spinning out of academia. Um, I spent, you know, so we, we started working on the company summer of 2020. And basically it took a lot of time for me to do customer discovery and, you know, make a, make a solid pitch and get some funding. Um, so sometimes it can be really, really helpful to spin out and, and, uh, grow quickly, but sometimes letting it, uh, letting it brew for a little bit is good. Um, and then, yeah, customer discovery, it's so critical. It's, it's just never ending. I think like, <laughs> Uh, you know, you think you, you could do it through a, a I-Core program and have it done with, but it, it's just never, never ends. So that's a big one. Such valuable yeah. takeaways right there, Richard. You know, I mean, in timing and cadence, you know, that's actually something that I don't think we've heard yet from other founders, you know, sharing tips and advice. I think that's quite unique. And I think, you know, that requires a certain amount of patience too, right? Um, yep. So, you know, fantastic. And, and, you know, customer discovery, it's truly everything across any industry. Sure. You know, I always think back even to like, I, I, I'll listen to how I built this um podcast with guy raz and i'll never forget him interviewing the founders of airbnb i know this is that's a completely relevant to this medical discussion nope. that we're having but what the key was for their business was until they got in front of their customers and realized exactly how they were going about leveraging and using their platform and you know showcasing their their apartments or houses mm -hmm. you know it was like <laughs> oh my gosh you know like yeah. it was those aha moments where it's like no 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 that is not what we want you doing and here now we understand you better try it this way and next thing you know boom the business flourishes right yeah. so i mean adopting that mindset across you know any any business any industry is so critical and important so um yeah just uh, well put there euros thank you yeah. so true so true yeah. and and again that mindset thing you're talking about there kyle it's so important because there's a couple of things that came through to me from you're talking about there euros you know you're talking about patient centric again that's been all the way through this conversation about thinking about women how you can help them have a better experience lead to hopefully better fertility outcomes and of course, as much as you're thinking about the near term problems, you've got that focus on the mission, on the horizon. So back to the timing, you know, not everything happens instantly. And no. so when you think about that horizon, like, you know, if you were to think five years into the future, where would you like to see Biosensei? What's that bigger picture for you? Oh, man. Um, yeah. Five years. I I hope we could do it in five. That, that'd be amazing. I'm I'm pushing for it. But like... I want to be what everything aura ring can't be, you know, um, actually measuring actual molecules that are so critical. Right. And, uh, you know, don't, don't mean to get a, a email from the aura team, but, uh, <laughs> you know, not just tracking things like steps or, or number of breaths you took, or, um, I, I want to have people in the real world, like wear a patch and get insight into their hormone levels that tell them more about their health, like the fertility health or stress or sleep state. Um, yeah, I starting with IVF, I, I think that's a great application for us, but um, I, I want to grow to something bigger than that. Yeah. Well, I'm sure like the listeners, you know, we can easily buy into that vision. And, uh, and of course, however long it takes, you know, make that happen. Because again, it's so important for families, for the women who can benefit and again, the couples who can you know create new families together. So yeah, wishing you well from the MedTech Impact podcast and from the listeners, of course. Thank you. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for all the support, guys. It's It's been fantastic. Absolutely, Eros. Well, you're doing a lot. You've you've accomplished a lot, and you've you've got a lot more ways to go, of course, yeah. right? Um, but yeah. you know, how do people get in touch with you? I'm sure there's so many people inspired by your story and your mission. You know, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, reach out on LinkedIn. I, I am active there. Uh, I'm not very active on other social media, so that, that probably be the way. Um, I think you can reach out through our website and we have some job postings there. Uh, you know, quick shout out. 
uh, to, to that part, but LinkedIn is probably the best, the best way. Super. Amazing. So bio sense S E N S and then the number eight dot com. Yeah. You heard yeah. it here. Uh, that's the way to get in touch or on LinkedIn. So yeah, just thank you so much you Russ, for coming on. Uh, of course, wishing you well with the bio sense eight mission. Thank you so much guys. And, uh, always, always happy to connect with the M2D2 folks. And, uh, really, again, appreciate everything you, you guys, have uh, helped us with. Absolutely. Amazing. Well, ladies and gentlemen, another huge thank you to Euros Kuzmanovic from Biosense8. Uh, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of the MedTech Impact Podcast. I'm Kyle Cruz. And I'm Richard Mikkeljohn. Until next time, keep innovating.